again. Thank you all for uh, joining EFF's Fall Member Speakeasy. It's great to see so many people in the audience on a uh, Tuesday morning to learn about digital freedoms. Love to see it. Um, if you're feeling up to it, uh, maybe let's warm up the chat box. Uh, feel free to write like where you're from in there. Let everyone know. Um, it's great to see how many supporters are from around the world here. So that's really cool. Um, about twice a year, we like to do these uh, member meetups for everyone um, to learn about digital freedoms, meet some EFF staff, meet some other like-minded folks. Um, so it's great to see you all here. Um, as just a quick reminder, the reason that we can do this work is because of the support from people like you. Um, we do this because you're able to donate, uh, talk to your senators, that kind of stuff, help us out. Uh, so it's really great to see the people that make our work possible here. So thank you. Um, and with, with that said, uh, we're going to talk about some of the issues EFF has been working on in both the U.S. and the, around the world surrounding governments justifying increased surveillance and censorship as a way to, quote unquote, protect the kids. Uh, so today we're going to invite a couple staff members to expand on some of the bills we're fighting, what you can do to push back, and uh, how we can get things right. So first up, I'm going to introduce uh, EFF staff attorney Mario Trujillo. Uh, at EFF, Mario focus on, focuses on Fourth Amendment and privacy rights. He is also part of the Coders' Right Project. Uh, prior to joining EFF, Mario was an attorney at the privacy law firm Zwilgen and clerked for a federal magistrate judge on the southern border and worked as a technology policy reporter at the Hill newspaper. Hello, Mario. Hey, Christian. Uh, it's good that everyone's uh, here in the chat. I'm going to be talking about uh, a few of the, some constitutional problems with a few state privacy, uh, state child safety laws that have been uh, struck down as unconstitutional. Let me uh, bring up my slides. And so, like Christian said, my name is Mario Trujillo. I'm an EFF staff attorney, mostly focusing on privacy. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few of these uh, state child safety laws. And so the uh, the basic framework is these child safety laws have two features to them. One is age verification, and the second one is content blocking. And so it's important to understand how these interact together. And so most of these laws require uh, a company to verify the age of their users. If that user uh, is determined to be a minor, usually that's a person who's under 17, uh, the laws require the service provider to block certain content for that minor. That's e either by restricting that minor from accessing the, the product at all, or it's giving that minor a diminished product, product. So it's a social media platform with uh, some harmful content removed. And so it's a uh, one way to look at it is age verification is kind of the mechanism that enables the uh, the um, uh, platform to censor or block content, and so we'll talk about, talk about each one of those. And so, what are the problems with age verification? Uh, first, it's important to understand uh, what type of age verification we're talking about. It, it goes from sort of least invasive to most invasive. And so at the least invasive, you've probably seen a button that requires you to uh, attest that you're either over the age of 13 or over the age of 17. More invasive than that is uh, uh, a button that requires you to enter your uh, birth date. More invasive than that is a requirement that a platform uh, verify your age through government ID, either a passport or a driver's license. And even more invasive than that is a uh, uh, recording or a screen capture of your face uh, in order to uh, run it through a biometric algorithm for the algorithm to uh, estimate the age of a person based on their facial facial geometry. And so each one of those uh, has inherent problems, but they all kind of uh, have these four problems within them. And so the first one is privacy and security. And so uh, by implementing an age gate, an age verification system, especially an age verification system that requires government ID, you're sort of eliminating one of the uh, the initial uh, sort of bargains of the internet is that uh, you can browse the internet anon anonymously. 
The second problem is that uh, age verification systems require data. And so that's data that a technology company can either uh, reuse or resell or repurpose for some other use. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, a lot of these laws have restrictions on what the tech company or the, the platform can do with that, that age verification data. But uh, you know, you're putting your data in, in the hands of a uh, extra data in the hands of a technology company and you're you know sort of relying on them to do uh, to uh, do what's right. Uh, so one, there's bad actors who might misuse that data. There's also uh, threats of data breaches, you know, not, uh, no law can really protect you from a data breach. And so sometimes the best use restriction is just a uh, collection restriction. Uh, next, uh, there are speech concerns, and the speech concerns overlap with privacy concerns. And so under the U.S. First Amendment, there's a, uh, a right to access and uh, distribute data anonymously. Uh, the age verification systems obviously would uh, hinder that, especially age verification systems that require government IDs. Uh, it, they also... Uh, these age verification systems was, would also deter both adults and children from accessing certain content. And so certain content that is either uh, embarrassing or sensitive, a person might not want to uh, have their name associated with that search term or that, uh, that query. And so that's gonna deter both ad adults and children from accessing that content. There's also uh, a second deterrence is that some privacy conscious people won't want to make that bargain that, you know, I want to read this news article, but I don't want to give up my personal data to do it. And so that's also going to be a deterrence from allowing people to access certain content. Uh, moving down the list to discrimination, uh, this is mostly in the context of uh, age verification systems that require a government ID. Uh, first off, many children don't have a government ID. You know, I, I didn't I grew up in a small town and I didn't travel uh, a lot. And so I didn't get a passport until I was 18. I didn't get a driver's license until I was 15 or 16. And so that eliminates a, a swath of children that don't have a government ID. Uh, more than that, though, uh, e there's certain populations of the of an adult population that don't have a government ID that's either uh, focused in low-income areas or in the undocumented community. And so that would either eliminate those people from accessing platforms in general or create extra barriers for them to uh, access the platform. And then finally, there are accuracy issues. And this is specifically in regard to the uh, age estimation through biometric collection. This is a new technology that's not perfected and it's questionable whether it could ever be perfected, but at the current current state, age estimation can uh, be off by a year or two. And so when you're trying to identify a 16 year old compared to an 18 year old, you know, you're gonna have a lot of uh, mismatches. So that's gonna be either over-inclusive or under-inclusive. Uh, so that's the first, those are the problems with age verification. The second, uh, Thing is what what's the problem with content blocking? I won't spend a lot of time on on uh, problems with content blocking because they seem pretty self evident. Uh, you know, if you enact a law that requires um, <clears throat> uh, platforms to block uh, certain harmful content to children, and you don't put up an age gate, that is going to diminish uh, the platform for both adults and children alike. If you put up a age gate and you uh, serve children a diminished project product based on a, you know a, a, a product that has quote unquote harmful content removed, uh, that's going to sweep up a lot of uh, protected content, even that children have a First Amendment right to access. Children have a uh, you know uh, they have maybe diminished First Amendment rights, but they do have First Amendment rights to uh, access content, and so. A lot of the uh, the laws are written in uh, vague terms to, to to block or censor uh, harmful content, and sometimes that that term harmful can you know be anything. It, it doesn't. Uh, sometimes they're written to maybe block pornography, but they're written in a way that it blocks all sexual content, and so that's going to be um, limiting children from from uh, accessing certain protected content. And then finally. 
uh, children aren't a monolith. It's uh, a lot of these laws are written to uh, to uh, stave off harms to minors, and that's you know it's it's sort of vague. Uh, minor is anyone below the age of seventeen usually, and so what is uh, theoretically harmful to a minor might not be uh, well. What's theoretically harmful to an eight year old might not be harmful to a thirteen year old. Might not be harmful to a sixteen year old. And so one of the, the key features of these laws that uh, has major problems is they treat children, you know, all from zero to 16 as a sort of one unit that has a, sort of the, the same sensibilities. And so <clears throat> how has this played out on the ground? There's already been uh, three court cases that have, uh, three courts have issued injunctions, which is just a ter temporary block of three of these child safety laws, one in Arkansas, one in Texas, and one in California. So the one in Arkansas, uh, it requires age verification, usually through government ID. And if a, a person is determined to be a minor, they are blocked from the social media platform, except with parental consent. In Texas, uh, the age verification system worked for uh, for online platforms that had a certain amount of sexual content. And if, uh, if that platform determines that a child's, uh, uh, or that person is a minor, the person is completely blo blocked from that uh, website. But the, you know, the term sexual content is, is very vague and it's over-inclusive and it, and, you know, it, it can range from everything, anything to, from obscenity, which is unprotected to pornography, which is protected to, you know, uh, sort of a, just a, maybe a risque uh, photo or something like that. And so those, those two laws were struck down uh, mostly because of the age verification. Uh, the courts said that uh, one, uh, it's gonna prevent adults from accessing protected speech because they're gonna be deterred from, from entering uh, those platforms. And then two, even when the age verification works and children, uh, you know, are blocked from certain content, they're gonna be blocked from, from content that they have a constitutional right to access. Uh, the California law is a little different in that it strongly encourages age estimation. And so that is the, would likely be the technique of a, a biometric face scan. Uh, and that age estimation does two things. One, it requires companies to uh, block certain content. Two, it would actually uh, give children uh, privacy protections, that would sort of be the, the lever to give ch children privacy protections. And so at EFF, we believe that age gate would be unconstitutional and it would sort of, uh, that's the way to implement both the content blocking and the, the privacy provisions. And while we like some of the privacy provisions, even you know, if they wouldn't have been sort of tangled up in this age verification system and content blocking, system, uh, you know, those privacy provisions are things we would like in a privacy bill, but when you uh, use an age verification method like uh, you know, age estimation to implement that, that uh, we think that uh, that's not going to withstand, that's not going to withstand uh, First Amendment scrutiny. And so those are three laws that right now have been blocked. Uh, there are two other laws, one in Texas and then a pair of laws in Utah, which will likely suffer the same fate and in the next couple of months. And you know, to the extent more and more states are passing these laws or at the federal government, more uh, Congress or the Senate passes these laws, they're likely gonna suffer the same fate uh, of just being struck down. Uh, the Arkansas, Texas, and California law are up on appeal, but uh, as they stand now, they're uh, on hold. And then, so what's the solution? I think uh, here at EFF, we think that strong data privacy legislation can be a solution. And I think it, it does two things these child safety laws uh, can't do. The first one is that uh, data privacy legislation has a strong track record of uh, being upheld by the courts as constitutional. Uh, just to take two examples, uh, the Federal wiretapping laws have been around for about 100 years. Um, the Supreme Court has called uh, HIPAA, which is a, uh, a data privacy law that regulates health data, a, uh, a, 
a smart law. A, uh, and so other laws have also been upheld as constitutional as uh, data privacy legislation. So it's, it's just uh, data privacy legislation is better equipped to survive these court challenges. Uh, the second big thing is that data privacy legislation actually gets at one of the root causes of what people perceive as ills online. And that's a uh, sort of a, a surveillance apparatus that is meant to serve and deliver targeted ads. And so one of our key priorities is to ban behavioral advertising and you add uh, data minimization and then you add uh, strong uh, enforcement mechanisms. We think that gets at a lot of the problems that uh, these child safety laws are trying to address in a sort of a censorship regi regime. We think that uh, data privacy legislation gets at that in a more straightforward manner. And so finally, I'm gonna sort of pivot. Uh, I've been talking about state laws. These are laws that have been, been enacted by states that were about to go into effect that uh, got struck down by the courts. But there are also federal proposals, uh, bills that are being debated in Congress and in the Senate that have many of the same problems, though not identical problems. And one of these bills is called the Kids Online Safety Act. Uh, short name is COSA. Uh, the Senate uh, this week is trying to use a procedural move to uh, pass COSA by unanimous consent. And we have uh, we put up an action alert to have our members call and uh, voice their concerns to their senators. We have a action page at EFF. If you just uh, type in COSA, you'll find the action alert. And so we urge you, uh, you all to spend five minutes uh, today and call your senator if you're in the United States and you know, ask them to not, uh, not ram through this, uh, this dangerous uh, child safety law. And so I think that's it for me. And I will uh, hand it back to Christian and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Great. Thank you, Mario. That was really great and super interesting to learn about. Um, we'll do Q&As for Mario at the end, but for now, um, we'll transition to uh, EFF Senior Free Speech. But let me restart. Uh, EFF Senior Speech and Privacy Activist, Paige Collings. Uh, at EFF, Paige focuses on fulfillment of civil liberties and corporate threats to speech and privacy online. Paige has worked with governments and activists across the globe to collaboratively facilitate change. Uh, welcome, Paige, and excited to hear what you got to talk about. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I think we're so excited to, to talk about this issue, which is transcending boundaries across different countries, um, and an issue which is so pervasive to kind of argue against. So like Mario, I'll be sharing some slides. Um, again, if you have any questions, please do uh put them in the chat and we'll we'll endeavor to answer them at the end so here we have the the uk's online safety bill which is um a really big piece of legislation it's now unfortunately the online safety act oh, i should enter slideshow um it's now the online safety act um and i'll talk you through how that came to be and why we're frustrated with it essentially so um, you know, we, we, we discussed just now the Kids Online Safety, all the different uh, legislation in the US, COSA, and um, we have here earn it. When we think about these topics, you might wonder why we care. Um, why is this such a pri big privacy issue? And I think essentially it comes down to one thing, which is that at our core, we all have the right to private conversation and to determine when we want to share information with our loved ones, with our family members, with our friends, um, when that happens, who hears it, um, and the moment and, and mechanism upon which we, we communicate that. And a bunch of these pieces of legislation really erode on that right. And, you know, in the human rights framework, that's uh, protected under the right to privacy in lots of national and international mechanisms on human rights. Um, but at, at its core, it's really about choosing those moments. And, and these bills kind of take away from that. And unfortunately, we're seeing it in, in many places. So Mario discussed uh, the different pieces of legislation in the US. But unfortunately, we also have the Online Safety Bill, now the Online Safety Act in the United Kingdom. We have the Child Sexual Abuse Regulation which I know there was some conversation already in the chat about that and uh, that's good news so I'll touch upon that a bit later in the presentation but around the world we're really seeing these things and if we look to Australia you know there's been some positive developments there 
to uh, with protecting encryption. But unfortunately, with the Online Safety Act, we don't have uh, that kind of trajectory. So it's been a long process working with the Online Safety Act. Uh, first, it was emerged in 2017 as the Internet Safety Strategy Green Paper. Um, and this strategy green paper emerged on the back, uh, unfortunately, of a young girl in the UK who uh, was exposed and saw more than thousands of people, uh, thousands of pieces of self harm content in the weeks leading to her unfortunately ending her life. When that happened, the government decided to attempt to take action to make the online space, as you can see here, the safest space in the world to go online and help shape an internet that is open and vibrant but also protects its users from harms a big claim you could say uh but that was essentially the goal and that's where we're at so in 2022 the online safety bill was introduced following as you can see here in many years of consultations and under its fourth prime minister uh the online safety act passed uh, just a few weeks ago at the end of october um, it's changed a lot since the on Internet Safety Strategy Green Paper. That was pretty targeted as a green paper. It had very sp kind of specific goals and asks pertaining to children's rights online, as I mentioned, emerging from um, the back of the young girl that uh, lost her life uh, or took her life in 2017. And the bill that we ended up with is uh, certainly very different to that. I don't uh, I don't know where that scribble came from, but uh, we'll um, so when we look at kind of what we've been working on with with EFS actions and the online safety bill, there were two kind of big focus areas that we we were really orienting our work towards. The first was provision called legal but harmful content, and this piece of uh, this provision, you know, the, the online safety bill is two hundred and sixty plus pages. It sought to contain everything, you know, uh, provision of pornograph pornographic content to doxing, to end-to-end -end encryption, to clients that mandating client site scanning. So it was extremely broad. Um, and in this, you know, there were lots of different issues, but the first one was the legal but harmful provision. And that essentially sought to criminalize any content that's definitely legal, but was harmful. So it might be insulting or inflammatory. Um, this was illegal. This is an illegal provision. Um, under the UK and European and international law, you can communicate content that's either, you know, shocking, offensive, insulting, and that comes actually from um, a court case that happened in the UK, Handyside versus United Kingdom. So that was a, a, a kind of one of the big core issues, and we were working with coalitions. We submitted a consultation, a, a briefing to the consultation, and last year that provision was removed from the online safety bill. So of course you were thinking, great, this is fantastic. The online, the, this legal but harmful provision has been removed, and things are just up from here. Soon we'll get the end of the bill. Um, but unfortunately, the, once that provision was removed by the government, they decided to go fully committed to eroding the right to end-to-end -end encryption. And so that's kind of how our focus oriented in lobbying on this piece of legislation. There were many clauses, specifically Clause 110, which, which subsequently changed to a number of different clauses, um, which sought to mandate client-side scanning um, of a credit with accredited technology. And that accredited technology would be accredited by the government um, and the UK's regulator Ofcom. So all of this is very insular. Uh, of course, we probably all know in this call, you cannot have a technology that just is supposed to scan for child sexual abuse material or harmful content. Um, a backdoor for one is a backdoor for all. It's quite simply uh, fundamentally impossible and incompatible to have a piece of you know technology that can scan for one thing and, and not scan then for everything <clears throat> so we were trying to make this argument and i think what mario was saying is this is such a polarizing issue we were talking lots with politicians we held briefings we were communicating with them on why this was such a problematic piece of legislation and specifically this clause monitoring private messages um and many of them were saying you know i maybe i agree you know i, I agree definitely but i don't want to take that's th that position publicly because I have to be seen as protecting children online. Um, and if I don't support this bill, it seems like I'm not protecting children online. Um, we were able to kind of get to a stage towards the end of the bill where there was a massive coalition of uh, security researchers, cybersecurity experts, politicians. Um, we had a number of different apps, Google, Signal, uh, Meta, 
uh, or many of the, the encryption apps as well, and services, Apple saying this piece of legislation is terrible, most of them saying it, if it does, we'll remove ourselves from the UK market because we're not prepared to undermine encryption um, by you know complying with this with this legislation. We also held a private briefing in the House of Lords. Things, you know, in the end, there was a big, big commitment, but unfortunately, it seemed like it was one one step too far for many of these people in the House of Peers in the House of Lords, which they were not prepared to take this stand. You know, they were they were very much um, communicating that it was that they were in favor, but it was too much of a risk, a political risk for them to defend encryption, which ultimately in the discourse meant um, not caring about children's rights. So the bill passed. Um, here's one of the amendments we were trying to to edit. Uh, you know, here you can say leave out privately. So we were going through this for a long time. Um, in the end, the bill passed uh, a few weeks ago, as I mentioned. But not all hope is lost. So specifically with this bill, that makes it quite different to many other pieces of legislation in the UK and internationally. Really, is that it can't be implemented overnight. So the bill itself is contingent on Ofcom implementing and uh, creating and then implementing codes of conduct and guidelines and rules and practice to implement this bill. So um, the next stage, and it, this will take years because as I mentioned, the bill is 260 pages plus long. Every single provision needs to be converted into an operational uh, piece of legislation that, that, that can be introduced. So Ofcom last week introduced their first guidelines it's nearly a thousand pages long so we've got a lot of reading ahead of us working on this bill um but it will be step by step so they've communicated that next year they'll be trying to seek to tackle the issue of encryption um and in that we've got a lot of capacity for influence they're reaching out to civil society we had a private meeting with them last week and a number of other civil society organizations uh, we're in contact with them building out the this piece of legislation into um something that can be operationalized into the law so that's kind of one thing. So it's not definitely, you know, it's not introduced overnight. It's client side scanning is not happening right now in the UK um, as a part of this law. Second is litigation. So maybe you're thinking this can't be legal. Uh, maybe it's not. <laughs> I think there are lots of litigation options when we go forward. Um, you know, we've got Article 8 on the right to privacy, the right to private life under the European Convention. Um, so that's one possible avenue of being able to take a specific component of this uh, this legislation to perhaps a judicial review in the United Kingdom or to the European Con through the European Convention rights to European courts, um, arguing the lack of proportionality, uh, illegality and legitimacy of this piece of legislation. Um, and other the campaigning side. So one of our colleagues is in London tomorrow for a meeting with Signal and a number of civil society organizations to really discuss um, this, this piece of legislation in the next step. So what can we do in our coalition? What can we do as EFF to make sure that the bill doesn't get, get implemented essentially? You know, how can we stop this? How can we get an injunction or how can we advocate for people to recognize their rights? Um, before it even happens. So I think what's really interesting is that not all hope is lost. We've we've actually got a period of time now where because the, the bill cannot be implemented straight away, we can really frame the language and discourse that's going to be going to be introduced. And I think when we look at other pieces of legislation, um, for example, the CSAR, so the regulation against child sexual abuse in the EU, we are experiencing wins. And so this is not an issue where the discourse is finalized and there is no chance of permeating through that. Um, you know, it was mentioned in the chat already, but this piece of uh, this regulation coming out of the EU is pretty much the same as COSA, it's the same as the online safety bill. It's, a, it's attempting to stop the distribution of known content, um, uh, actions against huge content, it has a detection order, uh, and of course, Reduces client side scanning as a preference. Today, so this is new information as of today, um, we reached a compromise deal. So, following you know, more than 70 organizations working across the EU and Europe, um, working on this piece of this on this file in the European Union, we were able to reach a compromise um, by the European Parliament. So here are a few of the of the big wins. So no mass scanning, which is a huge win. Um, the scanning must be targeted in a, with a specific suspicion uh, with judicial oversight. So unlike the, the UK's Online Safety Act, which has no judicial oversight or parameters on the use of accredited technology, this is very specifically targeted. Um, grooming detection is removed from the scope of, of detection orders. And I think within this parameter, uh, what was really interesting about this regulation is that 
the EU wanted to introduce AI to detect um, any harmful content on text messages or in emails. Um, and so removing that and having judicial oversight is really beneficial. Another is a you know protection of end-to-end encryption, which we've been in screaming at the European Union to protect for a long time. So private messaging apps cannot be subjected to any scanning technology. Age verification, as, as Mario discussed it at length earlier, no mandatory age verification for private messaging um, and app stores as well as safeguarding its use. Um, the EU can, you know, here, here is about web crawling and Europol and then also blocking orders. So even now it's restricted, which this is still problematic, you know, it remains possible um, on hosting services. So it, we reached a definitely a beneficial compromise based on months and months of, of advocacy at EFF and in a wider coalition. And the next step, so you might think, what's next? Uh, so this will now go to the European Council, um, where they will they will discuss their position, which is 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 not necessarily known at this point. Um, but there's an election in the European Union next year, and so if there's no compromise that can be met between the institutions, the the file could get stuck. Um, so we're going to keep the pressure on for a, a good final deal for consumers, for people in the European Union. And I think we can take this this win here as a, an indication and a recognition that whilst we're fighting these bills, there are there is, you know, there are challenges. Here you can see some some actions. You know, we're, we're part of these campaigns, um, raising awareness. Here is from a football match, you know, stop chat control. Um, Edry, you know, European Digital Rights Network are, have been coordinating this. So it's, it's really fantastic citizen initiative. Um, and here is just a, I thought, you know, we're talking today about US bills and, and, and UK and Europe and, and here it kind of all aligns in one picture, which is essentially, we've got people like Ashton Kutcher, you know, he is of course part of Thorn, but um, coming to the European Union and, and being able to talk in, in, the, in different chambers and institutions about this bill to protect the children. But our big, you know, big emphasis kind of to, to, to conclude this presentation is, we know that this, these bills, introducing client-side scanning, eroding rights to end-to-end -end encryption and undermining technology is not only um, not protecting the children, but it's indeed putting them at further risk of harm, especially ones that rely on encrypted communications and private channels the most. So we'll continue doing that. Uh, you know, the, the UK, there's a lot of potential now to mold the implementation of the Online Safety Act and in the, in the EU um, to really push for a final resolution that um, backs up today's win. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you so much, Paige. That was great. I think, uh, yeah, we got Mario back up too. So now uh, we've got some time to answer some of the audience questions that were coming up in the chat. Um, so I think we'll just get started. Um, this first one came from Cadigan, which who said, um, would it make sense if we somehow all agreed on using a separate a separate trusted party that would only provide this sort of ruling required age 16 meets age true slash false? Normally, I oppose eliminating it, but I doubt this issue will go away. Um, did either of y'all have thoughts? Yeah, so I think uh, I, that that's sorry. I think that question uh, is at that question comes up in the context of age verification and. The question is, uh, you know, if we move this age verification to a trusted third party rather than the tech company, does that make it safer? I think that that just moves the liability without eliminating the risk. And so instead of, you know, Meta, who's got that information, it's some third party that is unknown and maybe less trusted. And so that could, you know, it could pose even more concerns in case we don't uh, understand uh or trust that company. It can also, uh, I think it, it creates sort of a, a large uh, honeypot for, for data breaches. And so I think that rather than fixing the problem, I think it just moves the problem, but all the, uh, all the concerns still remain. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, next up, uh, this one comes from um, Augusto. I was just wondering, are laws assigning unique, unique identifier numbers to babies at birth a common thing around the world, or is it just Brazil? Um, that surely makes it easier for companies to tra track children's data and build dossiers of their behavior since birth. Nowadays, nowadays, you can't do anything in Brazil without a kid's CPF number. Have either of yeah, y'all so uh, heard about that? I, I, I can talk about uh, that from a U.S. perspective, and so I'll... Uh... 
everyone in the United States have it has a social security number. The social security number was originally set up to uh, give benefits to people at the uh, at the end of their retirement. Uh, I think the social security number in the United States is a good example of a of a uh, sort of a identifier slash data collection regime that was meant for a very normal uh, or a very narrow set of circumstances that has really exploded into this, uh, not, not a universal identifier in the United States, but it's definitely taken on a lot more prominence than, uh, than what it was designed for. And because of that, uh, the social security number is very uh, unsecure and uh, it has led to a lot of uh, uh, financial uh, fraud. And so I think, yeah, I think uh, at least in the United States, that is a that's a thing. Um, I haven't heard of proposals that uh, uh, propose using a social security number or a social security card as uh, the form of age verification. But I, I, if if uh, if an age verification system is asking for a government ID, I, I, I guess that that could be one of the methods used. But I, I don't think that that is a I don't think that's uh, something that uh, lawmakers are proposing. Cool. Um, I think this next one will be for uh, you, Paige. Um, with the recent passing of the online safety bill, do we expect to see messaging apps and services withdraw from the UK? Uh, and what would that look like? Uh, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it. Um, specifically because in the weeks leading up to the online the, the final vote of the online safety bill in the house of lords a number of messaging apps and services decided to publicly say that they would leave the uk market if the online safety bill passes which indeed it now has um the the rationale of those uh, proclamations is that they don't want to undermine end-to-end -end encryption on their sites and on their services and platforms, and therefore uh, the cost of compliance is too high. And I think this point is is interesting because there's a criminal liability introduced in the Online Safety Act for non-compliance with the provisions under this bill. So senior managers at uh, Meta, for example, or Signal, if they don't comply with this bill, can be imprisoned. Uh, they will also be fined extensively for non-compliance, I think it's 14%. So it's, it's a very, very high amount of, of money for non-compliance of the annual turnover. And so when if you if you're one of these services and, and now we're talking about tier one services, so big services, if you're one of these these companies um, and, and corporations, you've got the European Union where you have uh, provisions and legislation and files to comply with. And then you have the UK Online Safety Act, which almost contradicts many of those. Um, and if you're working within all these countries, it's perhaps nonsensical to uphold the Online Safety Act when you've got 27 other countries in the European Union and a stronger risk of non-compliance um, with, with those pieces of legislation. So I think it's, it's left to be determined that in, you know, in private conversations with some of these services, they have told me um, we're still very committed to upholding end-to-end -end encryption. We don't want to leave. It's, it's certainly the last, last option. But we still will if if we can't reach a compromise on how the bill is implemented, um, specifically on the technology that is supposed to be accredited to mandate client side scanning. Um, you know, we got a declaration in the week before the online safety bill passed that the the government recognised that uh, right now the technology doesn't exist to scan for child sexual abuse material or harmful content and not scan for everything else, which um, was a win because they'd refused to acknowledge that since two thousand and seventeen. But um, I think it's left to be seen. I, I hope that some of these corporations, indeed all of them, hold their word and, and do leave the UK market. But of course, the 60 million people will be losing out. And it's not just people in the UK, it's people communicating with those in the UK. Um, you know, some of these encrypted apps are used by, uh, you know, people who are seeking asylum and they're in detrimental situations coming out and they need to communicate for a safe passage into the UK or for human rights defenders sharing information from one country at risk to to maybe somebody in the UK. So it's not just people in the UK that we're missing out. So I really hope that we can find a solution before these services uh, have to leave the United Kingdom. Cool, thanks for that. Um, this next one's really interesting uh, and something I've thought about before um, from Grady. Uh, CSAM is such an emotional issue that it skews the entire framing of the issue. The issue is at the forefront to get people to accept surveillance that they otherwise wouldn't. How can this framing be challenged? Surely overblocking is also harmful to children. Uh, 
did uh, either of you guys have thoughts on challenging the framing for uh, CSAM? Uh, so yeah, I don't know if I can talk, sorry, uh, but we actually found this uh, in the uh, chat control. And the reason was that later in the game, the Europol secretly inserted their own uh, phrasing, uh, like one paragraph or so, where they basically said, like, any uh, police can use this data. So you should probably look for something like this, because I would bet it would be there as well. Okay, that's it. Hey, did you want to say something? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andre, for sharing that. And indeed, I think this is probably the biggest issue is tackling this narrative. This discourse is so pervasive. It's so paramount. Um, none of us don't want children to be protected, but by eroding their rights online, they are at more risk. Um, I think it comes from a number of different things, different angles. And I've seen in, in the chat some conversations about how can we fight against the discourse of uh, I've got nothing to lose, so I don't mind an invasion of my privacy rights. And I think it's about reorienting that framework to recognize that we do have these rights. So it's not about what's to lose, but it's I have these and it's something to gain. Um, when we think about face surveillance, for example, it's face recognition is maybe one of the most lovely things ever. You know, when you see somebody that, you know, after a long time on the street or if you're you're going home for the holidays and you see your family members and your friends, that's what face recognition should be used for. It shouldn't be used to scan out faces and, and surveil us without our consent and I think we can take that same approach into messaging services we have these rights to privacy so we can communicate with our loved ones the information that we want to and when we want to and we know when that's going to be taken and not just for us but for the the profits of big corporations and so restructuring that and, and trying to tackle it from a different angle because I think it can get really tricky also I think we've shown this many times going along the lines of but we have the right to privacy it's like i don't have anything to lose um you know children need protections they have rights to they need an anonymous channels and i think what's been super frustrating about these bills especially in the uk is that a lot of the advocates for the bill have also anonymous channels that children can report abuse or bullying or so they recognize that children do need anonymous channels to uh to report the harms against them but apparently not online so there's that i think sorry finally there's a much bigger issue which is that just because a child experiences harm online doesn't mean they're not experiencing harm offline and uh, whatever happens online is, is not in a vacuum. Um, and so really building out frameworks for children to feel safe both online and offline in a broader community holistic framework is, is also one approach to tackling that. I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> did you have anything to expand Mario or uh, did Paige cover it all for you? Uh, well, so yeah, the the bills that I I, uh, I outlined are are less about uh, uh, filtering and blocking CSAM, but there are uh, proposals in the United States, uh, you know, that uh, in in this filtering and blocking would also create liability or could create liability for end to end encrypted apps. Those are uh, I'm thinking of proposals like the Earn It Act or the Stop CSAM Act, and I think one of the one of the answers to that is is not to reframe the issue in in that uh you know CSAM is despicable and it should be stopped it's that uh law enforcement at least in the United States law enforcement has tools right now to uh to address that uh, there there are laws that create liability if uh if tech companies don't report uh CSAM when they have actual knowledge to my knowledge that has never been a law that's enforced there's also uh other laws in the book that uh, that uh uh, sort of outlaw the promotion of, of that kind of material. And that law is also uh, sort of not enforced. And so uh, I, I think one answer is to ask why, uh, you know, why these lawmakers are pushing these new proposals when they have enforcement tools. And one of the, one of the answers is for them to strengthen their enforcement of existing laws rather than creating new laws that uh, create a lot of different problems and uh, create uh, you know a lot of uncertainty for end to end encrypted apps that like Paige said offer a lot of value and protection in and of themselves cool thank you um this next one uh comes from Ben um, I'd be curious to get y'all's perspective on the practical enforceability of potential client-side scanning slash end-to-end uh, 
provisions. Thinking less about the mega tech companies and more about every project uploaded to GitHub that provides encryption and whatnot is the implication that every um, OSS, I think that means open source project going to pull from some mandatory repository. Um, do y'all have thoughts on that question? Uh, maybe from the UK side. Do you want to get married? No, no, you go ahead. Okay, I think uh, maybe taking the first part of the the question about the, the enforceability of client side scanning, um, something that we've tried to emphasize in the UK and across the EU with with stop chat control is that, you know, it's not possible to protect rights and implement client side scanning without erosion those rights um it's just fundamentally incompatible to have privacy and erosions on end-to-end -end encryption so um it's not enforceable it's a and i think that's the thing that we've tried to emphasize in the uk specifically which is that the technology that the government have consistently said um over the the last five six years is exists it you know exists and is possible we can client we can scan for csam and other harmful content uh, which is also really a subjectively defined group of at list of topics um and subject to change we can scan for clients uh, we can scan for that and not scan for anything else we can only use our technology and no other technology is possible i think what we've tried to emphasize at each stage of that is it's not possible to enforce that without opening it up for everything else so if you have a backdoor for the government with their credit technology you're then opening it up for hackers for for rogue states for harmful actors to expose and take advantage of that um and, and in doing so, it, it therefore renders privacy rights uh, un unenforceable. But I don't know, Mario, if you have a different elucidations on that. No, I'll leave it there. Cool. I think that we have uh, time for a few more questions. Um, this is one uh, that's been on my mind that I think you could answer, Mario. Um, you talked a bit about um, like a more consumer privacy laws uh, as a way to fix some of these issues. So a lot of states, including California, already have privacy laws. Uh, would a federal law replace these state laws or how would that work? No, no. So uh, the what EFF has uh, advocated for for a long time, one of the uh, one of the key pillars of a federal data protection law would be that it does not uh, override state laws. And so that has that along with the uh, the consumer enforcement uh, provision has been a, a large sticking point. But we think uh, any federal uh, privacy law should be sort of the floor of privacy in the United States and not the ceiling. And so, if California, uh, which has been a, a leader in privacy uh, legislation in the United States, uh, wanted to increase those privacy protections, we think that's a that's a good idea. I think that's. Uh, Going back to the sort of the the uh, purpose of the state and federal government, uh, states have have always been seen as sort of a laboratory for different laws, different and improved laws, and those sort of filter up to the federal level. And so, I think any any privacy law that uh, that gets enacted at the federal level, we would we would uh, push very hard to make sure that that's that's the floor and not the the absolute. Uh, uh, um, through ceiling of what privacy protections in the United States look like. Cool. Thank you. And um, for Paige, um, how could the online safety bill affect other social media and child safety efforts in uh, Europe? So the Online Safety Act has age verification um, provisions so like mario explained uh, i won't duplicate because it's almost exactly the same there are uh, provisions within this within this bill that are trying to prevent children from seeing content that's you know for example pornographic but again harmful which is pretty subjective um and it's requiring blocking children from or you know children from viewing these these websites and sites so not only is it trying to scan for content but it's blocking children or those underage of using certain sites and I think you know children are very in innovative it's it's not going just having these bills is not going to prevent children from from viewing these platforms and it's it's a an incorrect solution to a problem that we've we've been trying to communicate for a long time now so 
what happens in the UK, we've, we've mentioned this many times, I think it's probably a, going to be a blueprint for, for similar bills around the world, given that it's almost the first it's kind of have passed in such a way um, which has such erosions on client side scan of of encryption through client side scanning um and probably we'll see duplications or at least now a commitment from other countries to echo that i've heard that whilst i've spoken to governments around the world um so, you know the uk have this this pass in the uk so it's kind of involving the similar legislation but in that sense, we just continue to fight back. Um, and as we want, ha, you know, have this win today, a, a broad coalition of, of organizations in the European Union have been really fighting for the, the CISA regulation. Um, so not all hope is lost. And I think we can try and replicate those those strategies elsewhere and really make sure that, um, you know, the children that can access, you know, have device to access the online world are safe, but it in, in the way that we know best and not by um, preventing them from accessing certain websites and apps and by eroding their right to safe and secure channels of communication. Okay, um, I will just quickly ask since I lost like where we're in the, but I can tell you like in a very short uh, five minutes, uh, like very short how we went uh, to the EU parliament with Edri and how it worked and maybe the reason how we won. So maybe something you could re-implement or uh, use for your environment if you want i don't know if it's this uh if this means if this meeting is uh until eight or how much time do we have um i think we were close to uh wrapping up but i don't i don't know if uh Paige Mario wanted to hear, or if you wanted to like shoot us a note at info at EFF.org, everyone here can shoot us a note there and we go through all the emails and check those too. And I think you can you can also go on Scott's Stop Scanning Us, uh, or you go on the Edry website, uh, the European Digital Rights, um, as just been mentioned, and you can find the campaign there called Stop Scanning Us, Stop Scanning Me. Um, and you can and you can find out that and that given the the news today and the win today in the European Union, um, you'll probably see lots uh, on the EFF website in the coming days uh, and different social media channels as well to to hear that. But um, please do follow up on that because it's a really good win in a landscape of pretty dire legislation. So um, we want to amplify that uh, and share that this legislation and, and these types of legislation um, can, be, can be challenged and can, we can win. And we want to replicate that in as many places as possible. Cool. Um, and so with that, I think it's time to close out. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining again. And thank you, Paige and Mario, for presenting, answering some questions. It was really great to hear from y'all. Um, and also just another reminder, thank you all for joining and um, for being EFF supporters. Like I said at the start, uh, the reason we're able to continue this work is because of uh, your continued support. Uh, and if you know, you're here and you haven't donated yet this year, we'd love to have you stay on as an EFF member. Uh, you can donate at EFF.org slash join. Um, and if you have any questions for us, uh, please send a note after at uh, info at EFF.org. But um, until then, thank you guys so much. And uh, we'll see you at the next one.